thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to say that this project is just a small part of a, a larger thing I'm working on. Uh, the larger project includes um, contextualization, like uh, looking at Esalen oral traditions and oral histories, as well as <coughs> California mission histories and other things like hair and stuff like that. So. Recent scholarship in the field of gender studies has taken up the topic of female masculinity as a productive site for investigating the processes, discourses, and practices associated with the formation of masculine identity within a given historical and social context. This paper enters the dialogue surrounding female masculinity in hopes of, one, continuing the project of acknowledging multiple masculinities, including masculinities not necessarily attached to male-bodied persons, Two, opening up the subject of female masculinity to inquiry from within the discipline of Native American studies, including the burgeoning work on queer indigenous theory. And three, situating Native American female masculinities as informing and resisting structures of gender within settler colonialism. In this paper, gender is understood as a, quote, historical ideological process, end quote, as opposed to a fixed category of reference. In one of the most influential in-depth studies of female masculinity, female masculinity, Judith Halberstam writes that butchness has been understood as a dysfunctional rejection of womanhood by a self-hating subject who cannot bear her embodiment, unquote. Rejecting this popular definition, Halberstam's work rightly argues against popular penis envy interpretations of female masculinity and lesbianism. She calls upon Gail Rubin's definition of butch as a term for women who are more comfortable with masculine gender codes, styles, or identities than, than with feminine ones. In an effort to uncover the production of hierarchies within the scope of queered identities, Halberstam takes a close look at one particular manifestation of butchness known as a stone butch, who is both physically and emotionally impenetrable um, within her characterization, and thus stone. The author rightly understands butch as a category in constant flux, relying upon various contexts which include history, class, ethnicity, and others, yet save for a few tokenized examples of Chicanas and African Americans, her work analyzes mostly Euro-American structures of female masculinity in the United States. Therefore, much of what Halberstam writes on female masculinity is useful primarily for studies concerning Euro-American female masculinity. And like most mainstream gender and queer theory, remains silent on manifestations of indigenous queer genders, including Indian butchness. As a scholar of Native American studies, I find the silence sadly commonplace and indicative of larger issues surrounding the invisibility of Native American women, especially Native lesbians and queers, within the larger academic discussion of gender issues. Deborah Miranda, a contemporary poet, scholar, and citizen of the indigenous Esla Nation and of mixed blooded Jewish descent, situates the silence and invisibility of American Indian women within critical discourse as symptomatic of the destructive legacy of settler colonialism in her groundbreaking essay, Dildos, Hummingbirds, and Driving Her Crazy, Searching for American Indian Women's Love Poetry and Erotics. Miranda reminds us that those historical traumas that directly targeted Native women's bodies and our ability to express ourselves remain ever present and have ultimately displaced traditional conceptions of gender. As some scholars within Native Studies argue, many, though not all, traditional indigenous worldviews related to gender and sexuality honor a wider spectrum of genders and sexual expressions as compared with the patriarchal, heteronormative, hierarchical, binary models of gender so violently introduced to the Americas through settler colonialism. Miranda argues that one of the reasons why Native women's gender and sexuality concerns remain invisible in popular discourse is due to a general reluctance on the part of mainstream scholars and society at large to acknowledge the true story of this nation. For Miranda, one strategy for breaking the silence is for Native women writers of all genders and sexualities, including Butch, to voice themselves and their cultures back into personhood by tapping into what Audre Lorde famously calls the power of the erotic in order to give witness to wrongs and offer alternative narratives. Of course, the power of the erotic has been suppressed by settler colonialism. In this light, those writings related to Native American sexualities and genders, including female masculinity, are not mere expressions of corporeal desire or gender identity politics, 
but actually constitute powerful testimonies in the struggle for internal and external decolonization of indigenous individuals, families, and tribal nations. These efforts can also contribute to the decolonization of gender theory in the hopes of reclaiming a space for queer indigenous voices and uncovering models <coughs> of genders and sexualities which are not grounded in white male colonial dominance. In Miranda's poetry, the speaker's American Indian butch lover explicitly identifies as masculine. She calls herself butch, shops in the men's department, and her vagina at one point is characterized as hard steel, recalling immediately Halberstam's stone butch. But she does not index as physically or emotionally impenetrable. She is strong, and yet her strength seems to be drawn not from the threat of violence or dominance, but from her ability to heal. In this way, her butchness relates indeed to power, but not one which rests on control of female bodies. In this way, Miranda's construction of Native American dyke identity in the Zen of La Llorona offers a productive counter to mainstream constructions of female masculinity. The explicit use of the word butch in the poem, Love Poem to a Butch Woman, as well as in the poem Tenderness, make it starkly apparent that the speaker's lover identifies as both a woman, she has a woman's lips, and the speaker later says that the place that knows me is a woman and masculine. Still, there are clear references to the ways in which the speaker's Native American butch lover feels much more comfortable with masculine gender codes, such as dressing in men's clothing, and at one point in a dream sequence, a figure addresses the lover as please, sir, suggesting that she passes as male body. In Poem Tenderness, the speaker addressing her beloved says, your butch is black leather, connecting her with the tough, masculinized exterior, possibly BDSM culture. Lastly, the lover is repeatedly characterized as wearing 1950s male fashion, a familiar garb in butch femme representations, as she dons a, quote, clean cotton shirt, sleeves pushed back over forearms, and a pair of old Levi's as she leans against a truck. These images situate the native butch as participating in some stylized aspects of larger butch stereotypes. In an interesting move, however, Miranda's speaker seems to have pushed her imaginings of her lover's embodiment of popular butch appearance too far from the actuality as she recount, recounts, quote, you still wear those jeans, but swear you never rolled cigarettes up in a t-shirt sleeve. Funny how my memory invented things that didn't happen. Here the speaker seems to have remembered the lover within a scripted presence, which the butch woman then resists, however so slightly. This is one of many cases, in fact, where the speaker's expectations of representations of female masculinity are complicated by the reality of her lover's individualized and indigenized butch identity, leading both, both the speaker and the reader to acknowledge multiple female masculinities. Halberstam also associates certain formulations of female masculinity, such as the butch, with stoneness or impenetrability. We encounter an image of the speaker's lover associated with stone in the poem Tenderness, and I do not think its juxtaposition here is an accident given Miranda's knowledge of butch femme performative gestures, both in representation and experience. Immediately following that image of butch as black leather, the speaker decries, the speaker decries that you'd make stones rise up from the river and speak. Thusly, the native butch is associated with harshness, black leather, stone, and later in the poem, fencing out the deer with steel. And yet the association of stone with frigidity and impenetrability is turned on its head by this image of stones rising up and speaking. Instead of being silent and closed in this context, that which is hard, stone, can be rendered open and voiced. This native butch lover has the power to do this. She changes expectations of the image. Our speaker goes on to explain in Old Territory's New Maps that I can possess you entirely and yet be entirely possessed. Does this really constitute possession or something else? Here is a model of butch femme interactions which speak to traditional indigenous principles of mutual autonomy and respect. This representation resists colonialism's framing of masculinities based on assumptions of male dominance and female submission. Relatedly, other characterizations resisting discourses of dominance and violence as part and parcel of masculine identity can be found in the ways that the speaker's beloved embodies an intimate and knowing connection with the natural world. In many of the poems in the Zen of La Llorona, we encounter a, char a character aligned with female masculinity who cultivates deep knowledge of the land, its seasons, its gifts, its powerful medicines. In the poem Highway 126, 
The lover herself is constructed as part of the land. The speaker says, where's home? I can't draw a map, but I've wandered every curve and hollow. The place that knows me is the woman. She is made of the land itself. In this way, Miranda's characterization of indigenous female masculinity is one which explicitly includes the equation of human bodies, regardless of gender, with the Earth's body. How many minutes? Two minutes? Um, two. Two minutes, okay. Whereas the logic of settler colonialism understands the Earth as an object which can be reduced and commodified, much like some views of the female body, Miranda's representation of native female masculinity offers an alternative narrative of masculinity based instead on love and respect for the land. And just to heal, um, just to move on, um, more than this, however, it suggests that the strength and power of Native American butch identity is actually drawn from her close relationship to the land. We find that the same woman who is butch as black leather knows where to find herbs and medicines, and I'm especially interested in this specific use of the word medicines, which in our context entails a concept of healing beyond the physical, enveloping the sacred. Um, and then I go into some more examples I'd love to talk about, but for the sake of time. Um, <coughs> <coughs> and uh, Miranda's representation indeed offers an empowering alternative discourse of female masculinities, one which acknowledges the role of the sacred. It is an aspect of female masculinity that is unfortunately not addressed in Halberstam's work. To close, Miranda's representation of Native American female masculinity engages Halberstam's female masculinity, but departs at critical junctures. As gender is a historical ideological process, it is clear that more specific nuanced studies of multiple female masculinities are needed in order to adjust criti critical silences in the cultural studies of masculinities. This project sought to participate in a small way toward that redressing. Hopefully we will counter even more academic discussions of the ways in which queer indigenous studies and native literatures can productively engage with queer and gender studies in our collective fight for social justice.